A presentation of AIT. How well are all of your students learning? Are you constantly improving your instruction? Highly successful schools ask themselves tough questions like these. How do they find the answers? Monitoring student progress, it can be as casual as a principal visiting a classroom or as formal as a standardized test. At the highly successful schools we visited, monitoring was used to answer important questions about the school. We're going to examine five of those questions. Jimmy tells me he's in the top 98% of his class. That sounds pretty good. Hey, come back here. Good morning. Where are you going? Good. That's where you belong. Nancy Ishinaga inherited a school with severe problems. When she became principal of Bennett Q Elementary in Englewood, California, she asked herself, where are the students now? What is the level of academic achievement in this school? And she quickly found out. When I first came here, this was in 74, and the first test scores, state test scores, came out. Our third graders were reading at a three percentile, which is, you really can't get lower than three percentile. And I approached the staff with it. I said, three percentile, you know what that means? It means either the kids are all retarded, or something's not happening here, something's wrong with the program. Now, which is it? And I think if it's only one class... Nancy Ishinaga and her staff used the assessment data to take stock of where their students were. That's the first step in any improvement effort. And it became clear to them that the school's academic program was not working. And of course, they all had to admit, and they, many of them already knew that the program really wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. So we really had very little problems. We all agreed that all kids can learn to read. Me being a Skinnerian behaviorist, I came out with the fact that, hey, listen, Skinner taught pigeons how to read. And if he could teach pigeons how to read, certainly you can teach every kid in the school how to read. And that's where we started from. Who can tell me the sound? Ooh. Sound. Ooh. Ooh, close. Oh. My Ow. Turn. Let me see if, Ow. oh, you remember. Let me see it first. Ow, everybody, what's the sound? Ow. Okay, let me hear you say the sound. Kenneth. Ow. Perfect. Miriam. Ow. Good. Ooh, what do you do if you hurt yourself? What do you Great. probably say? Ow! And that's exactly what he did. Let's look at our... Return the ball without kicking. How's that? You never know where Euclid principal Esther McShane will turn up next. Breaking up fights on the playground, in the classroom watching a new teacher, playing an educational game with students, or joining in song with a group of fourth graders. She is constantly monitoring classrooms and test scores. One way she uses that data is to create standards of success for each child. Academic success will be that every child will, every child will show gain every year. So that a child that is on the 50 percentile this year, we should be, our goal should be the 60 percentile. That we should not be satisfied at any level. And I do have some children on the 11 percentile. We, that child must get the support from this school to grow up to 25 percentile, 30 percentile, because I believe that every child is capable of growing. It may take Jose three years to get to the 30th percentile, but my God, he's going to get there. Lou Yanu is another principal who uses assessment data to create standards for success. His school is Thorncliffe Elementary in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Here, 
all students are tested at the beginning and end of each school year. By identifying assessment needs of students early in the school year, we can tailor our curriculum to meet the needs of students. Once we know where the students are when they begin the school year, we provide the appropriate curriculum so that by the end of the year, on an assessment profile, we can demonstrate significant growth. At the new Suncook School in Lovell, Maine, success is measured by more than just test scores. So how much is that that you're showing right there? Principal Gary McDonald believes student involvement in learning is just as important. If you have children sitting in a small group, sitting by themselves, and they're actively engaged in learning, that to me means that they have an investment in their learning. Listen to it and see if they fit it, and if it does, you circle the S and then you put it in. Right, so what is not going to circle? big he is compared to this one because that one's curling up. Yeah, this one looks fat. Yeah, they get fatter and his, his arm is still out. It's not across his chest yet. To make sure her students master the school's key learning objectives, Nancy Ishinaga and her staff have created a rigorous yeah. curriculum and they monitor student progress to see right. if it's working. Okay. Now In other words, we have a very well-defined curriculum, and uh, I, I monitor what happens in the classrooms by periodic tests, which the teachers all give, and every teacher in every grade level gives the same tests. Uh, they turn in the results to me, and we go over them together to see where strengths and weaknesses might be, where changes in the tests or changes in the curriculum need to be made. I think there's too many papers here and too many things to look at. Could you guys kind of take a look at them and come up with something that's more usable for you guys? Could we even give it, instead of one, three, or four, could we give it a content score and a mechanic score? Yeah. Because they're, they're, they, they have something to do with one another, but they're two but different they're, right. things. It's too hard to uh, consolidate right. them. Right. And yeah, that yeah. might be easier. That would be easier. Giving them two separate scores. Yeah. Because uh, if the content is there, you can focus in right. on the mechanics yeah, and right. teach right. those. Right. You know. and, and that way you really, when right. you look at the papers, you're really narrowing, well, what do I need to work on? Right. Do I need to work on mechanics or do I need to work on right. whether or not they can right. develop right. ideas? Yeah. So you think the content... It doesn't online? mean that uh, we control everything. It means that within a certain parameter, the teachers have all the freedom they want. So if you go into every class, every teacher teaches differently and different things go on. However, the basic framework is there so that everybody learns what they need to learn. What does this activity look like to you? Some people call it chaos. But new Suncook principal, Gary McDonald, calls it active learning. Well, I think from the casual observer, certainly, you, you begin to question what was happening. There's kids all over the place. Um, you know, there's a lot of noise, a lot of interaction. I think when you get more involved in sitting down and being with the kids and watching them interact with the different centers, then you find that there is a tremendous amount of learning going on. These students seem involved in their lessons, but can teachers really monitor and assess the learning going on here? There's a tremendous amount of assessment that goes on within a day and within the center time. The teacher is interacting with the children individually. They're looking at each of the centers and creating, um, through observation, a real assessment of where each of the children are at as they move through their center time. And that's a part that we begin to talk about as staff as to what is the appropriateness of the activity. And it comes back to the question we ask often during the day is, what are we doing and why are we doing it? New plants and trees sprout on rotting logs. It can take 300 years. The highly successful schools we visited were determined Sometimes to create success for, for every child, not just the top trees. students. At Alki, Pat Sander uses classroom monitoring and testing to make sure no students fall through the cracks. Oh, well, we'll have to get, I'll give it a copy to you. I have it on my bulletin board. From my individual perspective as a principal, I want to know where the children are. 
I try and get into the classrooms every day and monitor what's going on in there. Good writing. One way Pat Sander uses the data she collects is to organize students into learning groups, groups that will challenge them to do their best. We move the children as they need to be moved. Uh, through the frequent monitoring, if we start to assess that a child's taking a growth spurt in education, then we'll move them to a group that's more appropriate to them. If we find out that maybe they've slowed down a little bit and the group that they're with is moving at a faster pace, then we'll move the child again. In the first semester of the school year, the first 90 days, we moved approximately 10 to 15 percent of the children. So, that, so it's not a tracking system once they're put into a group, but we monitor that and watch where they're going. For the last site council meeting, Alki has a site council, sort of like a board of directors that helps run the school. Four parents of Alki students are on the council, and they are closely involved in the details of student monitoring at their school. Moving right along. <laughs> Alki school has a diverse student body. The site council wants to be sure there is no achievement gap for minority students. And so one of the things we're doing in this, you know, in this group uh, of parents and, and teachers is, is looking at test scores. How are test scores of minority kids? Is the difference between them increasing or decreasing? And also, but look at the black children, look at the, the, the increase in the percentage of kids that are in, in the top three, or in the middle. But in the middle, mm -hmm. it went from, you know, 65% up to 90%. Okay, so in terms of that part of the bell, we said, hey, we're doing okay Except here. Except that but this, this means that they were in the top three. So all these things that we're doing at this school, are they making a difference for kids? What's happening, do you think? Back at New Sun Cook School, teacher Linda DeShane is also determined to see success for every child. What did he have for food? Ketchup? Just plain ketchup? Her learning centers work because she carefully monitors and knows each student. The children are in control of their choices, but the teacher is responsible for finding out the needs of the kids and giving them choices within a range of activities. And when you have children long enough, you, you can almost tell when a child is choosing something because it's easy or because it's, um, it'll get done quickly or if he's choosing it because it's a challenge. It's been successful for us. I mean, we feel comfortable with it. I said, your son doesn't seem to listen very well. And now you got the right answer. Now let's see what you can do here. Same thing here. This is you have to borrow from here to make it into a 10, right? So what does this become? At Bennett Q School, Nancy Ishinaga personally tests the academic skills of each new student. She uses this assessment to get parents involved in the child's learning. Our kids have already had fractions mm -hmm. because we do that in the first half of the year, in the fourth grade. So my suggestion to you is, is to go to the drugstore and look for workbooks on simple fractions and help her with that. Oh, I know that good. I know okay. fractions. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. And it would help because your son is in exactly the same boat. Of course, I have to do a he lot of counseling like. with the parents to make them understand why. And generally, they understand. Parents understand kids have to attain certain skill levels. In fact, many of them say, it's about time there's a school that requires certain kinds of learning before the kids are promoted. In my other school, they just pass them on. So we don't do that. Mice and snakes live in the forest. At Alki School, second and third graders are grouped together at what's called the primary level, fourth and fifth graders at the intermediate level. This is part of the early childhood model, pioneered by Louise McKinney. We say in our early childhood model schools that if a child doesn't learn in the way we teach him or her, then it's our responsibility to teach the way that child learns. Did anything happen to him after he drank it? No. Yes. Yeah. So should we say no freckles yet? Nothing. Did he sit and watch for them? 
Diane Tompkinson is a teacher at Alki. She was looking for a way to improve her students' listening skills. A staff development expert from outside the school showed her how to use an instructional technique called Story Painter. The children paint a picture to present their vision of what a story is about. Brains moving? All right. What do you want to say about chapter three? What do you think that Sabun was illustrating here? I think she was illustrating with the um, freckled truce and he was mixing all the things up together. And how do we want to say that the main idea of what he was doing in chapter three? Andrew was what? Andrew was... What was he doing? Was What's the making verb? freckle juice for freckles. He was making... The more strategies and methods you have, the more children you reach and the more interesting it becomes. And I think that's a key thing we're finding nowadays is letting children know there is more than one path to the house. And they're all acceptable and appropriate. And so that you have children taking risks in learning. You have, you have a lot more staff taking risks. You see, uh, there's so many things that work. And it's exciting to try out a, a wider variety. At the highly successful schools we visited, the educators were constantly monitoring student progress. Monitoring helped them answer important questions about the school, such as, how do we define success? And are any students falling through the cracks? Successful schools are in a constant mode of self-improvement. They use monitoring to judge their efforts. Bottom line is student achievement, and we need to continue to work on it. We need to focus in an area, we need to grow in that area, and as we see growth in that area, we need to identify another area so that we can continue to build on techniques, strategies that can equal success for children. Presentation of AIT. Ineffective Instructional Strategies. Number 17. A strategy for keeping students on task. And that happened during the reign of Louis the 14th. Or was it Louis the 15th? Uh, maybe it was Louis the 12th. Want to see some real strategies? Strategies that work? That's what this program is about. In highly successful schools, the educators work to develop effective instructional strategies, strategies that produce results for their students in their schools. In this program, we'll examine five strategies these schools use. You can read this book. So I'm going to start by reading my book. Successful schools create effective ways to group students for instruction. You can either listen to me. At the Van School in Pittsburgh, some students are placed in a program called ELS, Early Learning Skills. ELS acts as a transition period between kindergarten and first grade for students who are not ready to advance. If you give them a year to learn the importance of, of language and work on fine motor skills, listening, uh, attention span, and you also give them a year to build up their confidence, they usually do very, very well. Van Principal Doris Brevard is a strong supporter of the Early Learning Skills Group. She calls it an ounce of prevention. We feel here if you can solve the problems, if you can get the children help, 
at a very young age, then that will eliminate the more serious problems when they get older. That's why we stress in the beginning of the reading instruction that the children master whatever is being taught before they move on. Like other kids, the ELS students can't keep their hands off the school's computers, but they aren't playing games. They're using educational software that Nadine Dega developed with her husband. Well, who do you think he's the boss of? Of the soldiers. Of the soldiers? Wow, do you think that's an important job? You when you see something, that the kids really like it, and it's, it's valuable to them, and something's working and getting through to them. It makes us all excited, you know, and the extra work and the extra time. You don't mind doing it if you see results, and if you'd see these kids' faces whenever they're working at the computer, it, it's just exciting. Alki principal Pat Sander is also a strong believer in grouping to support instruction. She and her teachers monitor to find each student's individual learning style. Then they create instructional groupings based on the children's needs. We move the children as they need to be moved. Uh, through the frequent monitoring, if we start to assess that a child's taking a growth spurt in education, then we'll move them to a group that's more appropriate to them. If we find out that maybe they've slowed down a little bit and the group that they're with is moving at a faster pace, then we'll move the child again. In the first semester of the school year, the first 90 days, we moved approximately 10 to 15 percent of the children. So that, so it's not a tracking system once they're put into a group, but we monitor that and watch where they're going. In some schools, children in learning groups are given labels. You don't see the labels, but they exist, and they may stay with that child through every grade. That doesn't happen at Alki. The basic philosophy goes back to all children can succeed. And when you place labels on children, expectations for those children accompany those labels. And what we wanted was to make sure that we weren't holding children back because there was a label that was put on them because of some bureaucratic need to rationalize how monies was being spent. Another important trait of successful schools is appropriate pacing of instruction. The emphasis here is on accelerating the learning for all students, even those who are behind. Without acceleration, these students will never catch up. Now I can take that information. This is Thorncliffe School in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Monica Allman teaches a group of students pulled from regular classes because they were not doing grade level work. Her goal is clear, bring every student up to grade level in every subject. Thank you. A really good example is in math, a number of my students, my grade sixes, started off at a low grade three level. They could barely add, subtract, multiply, or divide. I told them that I had no intention of keeping them in grade three if they could prove to me they could master a grade three um, math curriculum. So we worked at it and they passed the grade three, 80% plus mastery. So I put them in grade four. They thought this was wonderful. They did that, they mastered that, I put them in grade five. They thought that was wonderful. They mastered the grade five and I put some of them into grade six. They were then pestering me saying, would you put us into grade seven? Because a number of my students should be in grade seven. One should be in grade eight. And I said, yes, I'm not here to hold you back. I'm here to encourage you and make you the best that you can be and to bring you along as far as I can. You're doing all snakes, so you're going to have to tell you decided to... In these classes, the pacing of the instruction is geared to help all children succeed by emphasizing their strengths. Golden cut. Right. Good girl. I want them to be aware that they have weaknesses because I believe everybody in, um, that is a learner has some weaknesses somewhere, but that you will use your strengths covering. to overcome those and weaknesses. And I'm very, very, very demanding in that way. I want them to be the very best that they can be because they're our future. 
The important thing about crickets is that they can sing. John, this is wonderful. And who did this one? Oh, At Alki Elementary, Principal Pat Sanders' approach is to teach as though every child were gifted. At Alki, what we've tried to do is no longer remediate children, but accelerate them. We believe that the kinds of education that people have supported for gifted children over the last five or ten years are the kinds of instructional approaches and the kinds of education that all children should have. Okay, first we need to look at the ones. We need to look at the ones and see if we need more ones, right? Do we need more ones yes. this time? Ratana? Yes. Yes, we need more ones. So Alki students who need extra help in some areas will get it, but they are still held to the same standards as other students. Okay, I require that teachers frequently monitor student achievement and that that student achievement comes to the office and that children attain an 80% mastery in reading language arts and mathematics objectives. It's not to say that on the first time through that child may do that and that will hold them in that place, but four or five months later, reteaching and through some of the other activities, I would hope that retesting takes place and that we can show that that child has been able to, in fact, move up on the mastery level. Do you think it's a dairy? Okay, we'll come back to you. What do you think? Dairy. Nicole, you think dairy? And Sophia? Dairy. Should they think dairy? Why Meet another principal who sees a potential for excellence in every student. Beacon Hill's Gary Tubbs. To find that potential, he expects teachers to use techniques that accelerate learning. French fries, because they both are potatoes. We have taken our menu. What we have found in working with gifted educators, or educators who have worked with kids who have been tested to be in the gifted range, say these techniques work with all children. Now, there's a lot of research to show you can actually raise intelligent quotients by that kind of teaching. So all children are gifted, and we just haven't all necessarily discovered their giftedness in all areas, in the areas that they excel. Mrs. Crenshaw, I think this time your students have gone a bit too far. We need insect research. Highly successful schools demand that students be involved in their own education. Teachers at these schools use instructional approaches that promote active and enrich learning. At Alki School, second and third graders are grouped together at what's called the primary level, fourth and fifth graders at the intermediate level. This is part of the early childhood model, pioneered by Louise McKinney. We say in our early childhood model schools that if a child doesn't learn in the way we teach him or her, then it's our responsibility to teach the way that child learns. We also know that all of our children are not analytics, and that analytics might do well working with workbooks, but the majority of the children in our schools who do not learn well tend to be very global learners, and so they learn better when they have context and meaning. It looks like turkey. What's it feel like? To provide context and meaning for their students, Alki teachers Diane Tompkinson and Lori Eba are about to lead a field trip to the beach. The trip will complement the students' classroom lessons on sea life. The first step is getting the students ready for the trip. Do you think we need to know a lot more to become beachologists? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. do you think our trip to the beach tomorrow is going to be something that we're really going to learn a lot of things on? Yes. Yeah. Do you think it's going to help us? The next day, the students enjoy some hands-on learning. The teachers hope this active experience will motivate kids to learn more about sea life. See all of these little areas underneath here? All of these little areas underneath here are are their feet, their two feet, and that's what they attach to the rocks with. Successful schools use a variety of approaches and techniques. The same students who went to the beach now put together their own books about the field trip. They'll write poetry, create math story problems around sea life, and do art projects about the creatures they saw. How many shells? It's a way to bring real life experience so that the child can then take that information back and write about things. They become totally engrossed in what it is that they're doing. And the motivation is there, the, the feeling that, God, we want to learn all we can about it. And it just seems to create um, 
a feeling in them that they they can do it and they want to do it and it, it has meaning to them and I think that's the whole point of what we're doing for kids is to create meaning for them. Teachers in successful schools are like chameleons. They adapt. They know how to customize instructional materials and methods for their classrooms. The driving force is student needs, and the adaptations help reinforce the school's instructional mission. Well, I hope you're ready to have some fun this afternoon. We're going to do an investigation that deals with, guess what? Matter. matter. What is matter? Anybody know? You have an idea? Yes. At the Rice School in Dallas, matter. science teacher Georgia Beatty has a terrific imagination. She uses common materials found at home to create original and active lessons for her students. Okay, now you need just some rolling. You don't need any more liquid. Okay, why don't you two guys get each other started? If you're not willing to take in a class after school or go the extra mile or search for something beyond the textbook, put the textbook on the shelf and do something creative, then this isn't the place for you. We're not a textbook-oriented school where we just simply, you know, start at chapter one and proceed through chapter 14. We're very different. As long as the kids benefit and that's the end product, it's okay. Just a little bit right there in the center. Okay. Now you two partners. Like a chameleon, Georgia Beatty adapts to her situation. When her students need something different, or when the school policy changes, she changes too. And even when you get to a point where you think it's polished and something changes and you then you wind up starting all over every every time they change change the textbooks or the learner standards that we get from the state i feel like a brand new teacher again because i'm having to dig and and look and try to make something fit to the particular needs of the kids welcome to the new sun cook school in lovell maine give them half a chance and every educator here will tell you about the school's mission creating lifelong independent learners to realize that mission, they customize their curriculum and their teaching methods. Rhonda Poliquin is a fourth grade teacher at New Suncook. She calls herself a guide, a person who helps students learn by teaching them how to find information and solve problems. She has adapted her entire curriculum to meet that goal. I think we've worked towards kids becoming independent learners so that you won't see as much uh, teachers standing in front of the class and lecturing to kids because we want kids to find out how to get that information them themselves and if there's something they want to find out about giving them the tools and the skills that um, they need to be able to find out that information. He's in the pupa stage but he has I think he might have just turned mm -hmm. because half of him is sticking out and he has a little bit of black right there. Okay, Maybe, can you write that down in your journal? Really the goal is to get kids to look at problems in different ways um, that you can look at it through an example as, as a scientist or as a historian um, and that using those perspectives it will help you to solve problems which is part of becoming an independent learner. Introducing the Chi Square Marching Band. He's shading away two-fifths of the world's rainforest. At successful schools, the educators are always searching for new ways to steal time from the school day for reinforcement in language and math. For example... At Rice School in Dallas, the students begin every day by reading to the accompaniment of classical music. Oh, my head hurts, says Leslie. Wow, you saved my life, said Paul. At Euclid, well, Principal worry. Esther McShane often reads to her students during the lunch hour. Okay. And at Beacon Hill School, students practice their computer skills by writing poetry. I saw a little butterfly in the bushes. It was a nice butterfly. And, uh... Welcome aboard. Today's field trip at New Suncook is another good example of how schools steal time for language and how teachers at these schools integrate language into other lessons. Here's the story of a 
sorry caterpillar by the name of Benny Miller. Benny Miller is a song about a caterpillar who dreams of being a butterfly. But after his transformation, he is captured and becomes part of a boy's collection. It's really ironic now to think that Benny Miller had to die. So poor Benny died because some little boy caught him for his collection. Now would you like to draw some pictures to go with that? OK, great. We've been studying entomology for quite a few weeks now, and one of the concepts that we really want to get across to children is the idea that um, nature is very fragile and we need to protect it. This is a literacy activity, and we like to bring literacy experiences into the field. And it also you might inspire some of their own writing when they get back to the class. Other students on this field trip will search for insects in the field and in the stream. After some exploring, Susan Steller's class will design their own insects, complete with camouflage. By combining entomology with language and art, the new Suncook teachers help strengthen basic communication skills. Plus, it's just plain fun. I think they're having a wonderful time. I think they're learning a lot and having fun doing it. At the highly successful schools we visited, the educators develop instructional strategies that work for their students. They group for instruction. They carefully pace instruction to accelerate students. They create active and enriched lessons. They customize instruction to their students' needs. And they steal time for language and math. These strategies are designed to help every child succeed. Presentation of AIT. We believe that it is our job to educate the kids, to make them literate. It's not the home's job, it's our job. If the home helps, it's fine. But if they don't help, we still have to educate and make the kids literate. Kids who come to Bennett Q, if they're here for any length of time, you can be sure that they can read. They can write, they can compute, and they can speak well, because this is our job, and this is what we plan to do, and this is what we do. Plus two is nine, so ninety three two is seven. Okay, once again, correct. You're learning real well. I'll bet you if you. At the highly effective schools we visited, we found principals and teachers who worked together toward a common goal: high levels of attainment for all students. At the Euclid School in Los Angeles, Principal Esther McShane and her staff focus on student learning. Honoring the, His the Hispanic Cultural Month. We're only here for one reason, and that is to educate children. And I'm responsible for the education of every single child that enters this gate. I, they, they have entered my sphere of life, so I am responsible for it, and I need to provide the climate, uh, the environment where learning can take place. Group two will use computers, and you will uh, recreate stories. I want my children to believe stories. in themselves and to believe that they can accomplish anything they choose to. And I realize that my job is to teach them strategies for accomplishing these things. And we left the house unguarded. 
At the Bennett Q School, just outside Los Angeles, Principal Nancy Ichinaga has a similar partnership with her faculty. You want to look at that? Yeah, I think this is... A school should be a place where kids come to learn. A school should be a place where a kid succeeds and where a kid is valued. And we have a specific goal, so when a kid leaves us, we want him to have certain knowledge, certain um, skills. We want him to be able to go to the next step and be successful. This clown has a green flower. OK, great. Which one? If you get a good two. principal two. Thank who you. knows what she's talking about and knows curriculum and knows her people, then, then anyone can do it. And, and not, no one should take excuses. We don't have excuses for why children can't learn. First, you have to get their attention. I pledge allegiance to the flag. When principals and teachers focus on learning for all students, the first priority is maximizing the time available for learning to take place. Discipline is one important element in providing an environment for learning. What's the month? You can tell me the name of this month. Philip. November. Excellent. What letter does the word... At the Van School in Pittsburgh, Principal Doris Brevard feels strongly about her role. The principal must provide the atmosphere, and then it's the teacher's job to teach. But if that teacher can go into his or her classroom and teach 35 minutes of the 40-minute period, then something will be accomplished. But the principal must see to it that the discipline throughout the building is such that the teacher can teach the 35 minutes. No, so what did he have to use to look at that picture Kathy Gallagher teaches fourth grade at Van. I know that when I go in my room, I will have an atmosphere in which I can teach. And I think one of the things I always remember when I first came to Van, she said to me, you can teach whatever style you like. Your style is your style. And as long as you're teaching and children are learning, that's all I ask of you. And she also told me that when I go in my room to teach, I will have an atmosphere in which I can teach. And if I don't have that atmosphere, then that's her job to provide it for me. And I have, it's always been provided for me. Another way to maximize learning time is to move swiftly from one class activity to the next, as in Dana Brooks' class at the Rice School in Dallas. Just make sure your pencils are put either in the container on your tables or on the floor. I'll give you about three seconds to get yourselves together. Three, two, one, zero. Okay, if you re will remember... Let Whether it's sure a teacher-centered school, such as the Rice School in yesterday. Dallas, or a more student-centered school, such as New Suncook in Maine... Right now, it's time for you to clean up your space and go to your meeting area. Transitions take very little time. If we had to yell to them or say, okay, it's time to clean up, they wouldn't hear us. So by clapping a pattern, it brings their attention to what we're doing. And the hands on the head is, they can't be touching anything while they're listening. So they, they have a better listening time when they, when they have the hands on their head. Maximizing learning time also means that every possible minute is devoted to teaching and learning. At the Euclid School in Los Angeles, that can even mean having the principal read stories to the students at lunch. Leslie reached down for him. Try to grab my hand, she said. For a principal like Esther McShane, maximizing learning is a high priority. Effective use of time is one of the things she looks for in the classroom. What I look for in a classroom is to see time on task. Why is it that the child is engaged in that activity? Is that activity challenging? Does it raise another level of awareness for a child? Are children exchanging ideas with one another? A deer, where does it look like a deer point? All I'm saying is that if you'd been a little more proficient in math, this would have never happened. Lie. 
behind. I. Which eye is it? I blinking. Put it down. At the Van School in Pittsburgh, their goal is for all students to master the academic content. The curriculum is structured to help students achieve that goal. We're going to do this step by step. We're going to get it right. Okay? The primary level is the foundation for the educational system. If they start out and they're passed through and they don't have the basics for reading, they don't have the basics for math, they never get it. It has to be achieved in the primary level. And we firmly believe that and we work for it. Great job. I knew you could do it. Very good. Van Principal Doris Brevard has the same conviction. We feel here if you can solve the problems, if you can get the children help at a very young age, then that will eliminate the more serious problems when they get older. That's why we stress in the beginning of the reading instruction that the children master whatever is being taught before they move on. It's STEAM, that's right. We know how to direct our kids to make it work. We know the problem before it happens. At the Bennett Q School in Los Angeles, Nancy Ichinaga also stresses the value of a structured, sequenced curriculum. We have worked out a system where everybody goes through, everybody is taught specific things that make them successful students. And it's what every teacher does. That's a perfect explanation. So would you read that statement, Eleanor, for us? Howard Rothenberg teaches math at Bennett Q. Or you should have common denominators. If you don't have the foundations from the first, second, third grade, you can't begin fourth grade where you need to start. And you have to go back and remediate, and you're losing time, and the children, and that's what happens in most inner city schools. The children are years behind, because every year has to go back and repeat what they did not learn previously. Well, we do not have that problem here for the most part so that they can see if they've forgotten that they multiplied everybody. What did you multiply by here? Three. Three to get nine twelve. That's just what I meant. All we right. have a very structured very curriculum good. at right. each grade Thank level, you. and every teacher knows what he or she is responsible to teach so that the following year's teacher can take up at that spot, and the kids are pretty much at grade level, and you're able to start there and, and, and work from that point. One of the very important things about our school is that our kids are held accountable for their learning. In other words, we have expectations by grade level for every kid. And the kids of the parents know from the very, very beginning that if they are in kindergarten, these are the things they have to master before the year is over. And if they don't, they probably will not go on to the next grade. Parents understand kids have to attain certain skill levels. That's not new. In fact, many of them say, it's about time there's a school that requires certain kinds of learning before the kids are promoted. In my other school, they just passed them on. So we don't do that. At the Alki School in Seattle, the curriculum is more flexible. <laughs> Principal Pat Sander is just as concerned about success for all students, but she has her own approach for reaching that goal. We believe that the kinds of education that people have supported for gifted children over the last five or ten years are the kinds of instructional approaches and the kinds of education that all children should have. So that instead of saying you have to crawl before you walk, some children may in fact walk and go back and learn to crawl later. Now, we're going to be doing quite a few things over the next several weeks to celebrate and continue our um, study of the rainforest. What I'd like you to do now is take your spelling paper because our spelling words this week are rainforest words. Fred Pruitt teaches at Alki. His class is studying the rainforest in science. That content is also used to teach spelling and build vocabulary. All right. The word Amazon, to teach punctuation. The M or the A. And also math. He's shading away two-fifths of the world's rainforest. Whether a school uses a highly structured, sequenced curriculum or one that is more flexible, in highly effective schools, the emphasis is always on mastering academic content. I have a job to do. I'm going to be with these children for one year, and my goal is to 
help them want to learn and to learn as much as they can in that one year because they're not going to get that chance again. It's a good thing this school provides a lot of individual instruction. At least I'm falling behind at my own pace. To make sure students are learning, highly effective schools monitor their progress and provide special help when necessary. At the Thorncliffe School in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, Principal Lou Yanu has goals for each student. We have identified for each individual a learning profile so that over the course of the time that the student is in the school, whether it be one year or seven years, kindergarten through grade seven, we would be able to track their progress. The goal is that every child is capable of high levels of success and that what we wish to see for each individual child on a year-to-year -year basis is growth from September through June and that that growth profile continue to raise as they continue on at our school. A story that you're thinking of? Another one of our goal statements and belief statements is that if children can't learn the way we teach, then we must teach the way they learn. If a child in a, in a classroom is having difficulty learning, the teachers have committed themselves to working with that child. Aha. Okay, now sometimes we're in places where we sit really close to each other, and what happens, you had mentioned to me earlier, Jared, something that you want to do when you feel kind of squished. What do you want to do? You want to what? Push them away and get them out of the way because you feel squished. And then what happens, Chris, when somebody pushes you, what do you want to do? Push them back. Push them back. And then what happens? And then sure enough, you end up in a fight. There's no doubt about it. But we're going to practice some skills today so that hopefully you will remember not to want to go, get out of here, OK? This is called ignoring distractions. At Thorncliffe, helping students learn can mean teaching behavioral skills in classes, such as this one taught by Pat Castoros. The purpose in having the kids come into the skills program is that the teachers have um, checklisted certain behaviors in the classroom that they notice that they're lacking in those particular skills and so need practice in those areas. Go for it. Yes, Stephen? Can I you certainly can sharpen your pencil. If you're not able to behave and you're distracting others and you're distracted yourself, then you're really not picking up the academic things that the teachers are offering you. It fits into the basic philosophy of the whole school that learning is important, that practice is important to be the best that you can be. If you're lacking some skills, we'll offer them to you so you can better your life. At Alki School in Seattle, Pat Sander uses a mainstream approach to ensure student success. One of her first moves as principal was to get the non-English students into regular classrooms as quickly as possible. We've tried to do an immersion technique and instead of having those children pulled out where they're in a room with other children that are speaking the conglomerations of languages and dialects, we have looked at instructional placements that are appropriate to them and mainstream them in with the rest of the children. And so consequently, the English language then uh, seems to take off much more quickly with those children. What you can do is type in the list of words on the crossword magic. The same approach applies to children with learning disabilities or physical handicaps. They spend a small part of the day with special ed teacher Tove Anvik or in individual instruction. But the majority of their time is spent in regular classrooms. They need to be in class. They will learn more by learning from their peers and from their teachers and by learning how to use the textbooks and how to listen and how to take notes. Those are all more useful skills for them as they go on in school than pulling them out and working one-on-one. -on -one. The basic philosophy goes back to all children can succeed. And what we wanted was to make sure that we weren't holding children back because there was a label that was put on them because of some bureaucratic need to, to um, rationalize how monies was being spent. It takes a combination of factors to make a successful school. 
but an emphasis on essential learning skills is one of the most important. The schools in this program maximize the time available for learning. They design a curriculum that stresses mastery of academic content. And they provide support for students who are not succeeding. I think that a child who doesn't feel good about himself cannot feel good about the world. So we try to make every one of our kids successful, at least academically. So whatever may be wrong with another part of his life, at least this part is good. And we hope that for many of them, this will carry them through. And I think it will. I really do believe that it will.